welcome to Plain Talk. Thank you very much for joining me as we discuss the strike in the education sector. For the first time since 2003, there was a strike going on in the public sector, arising from the failure by the government and the Guyana Teachers Union to arrive at some accord on the question of wages, salaries, and other conditions. Our guests for the evening are Ms. Coretta MacDonald, General Secretary of the Guyana Teachers Union, Mr. Colleton Nicholson? Collis Nicholson. Collis Nicholson, I'm sorry. Regional Vice President for the County of Demerara of the Guyana Teachers Union, and Mr. Lincoln Lewis, General Secretary of PUC, friend of this program. Welcome all. Thank you. Now, a strike, any strike in any social sector, has significant repercussions, mm -hmm. education, health in particular. How did we get here and why couldn't we prevent it? Corrector MacDonald, General Secretary GTU. I think you're asking the wrong person the question, you know. Because the thing is, the GTU submitted a proposal, a salaries proposal, proposal for salaries and other benefits to this government, to the government in November of 2015, because we recognized that our agreement was coming to an end on the 31st of December, 2015, and that's the agreement that we would have signed with the PPPC government. So we were ahead of time in presenting our document to the Ministry of Education. That's 2015. 2015. We are now in 2015. In November of 2015. We were expecting that the ministry would have perused that document and start talking to us somewhere in January of 2016. So January, February, March, maybe in April of 2016, we would have been able to agree on the conditions. Thereafter, we would have had our discussions and the sign off. Nothing of significance really happened during then to now. Between November 2015 correct and August 2018 and because of that we're at the stage that we're at right now Lincoln perhaps you can come in and I, I, I don't mean to excuse you sir I, I, I need your participation what's the kind of, in, in terms of industrial relations how does this strike you um, I do not believe that at any point um, the actors from the employer side were serious about addressing the, the, the proposals that were put in front of them. You know, it is instructive to note that the government has employed a posture of, of non-engagement with government agencies, non-engagement with um, the representative workers. It is happening, it happened with the Guyana Public Service Union, mm -hmm. and it happened with the Gao and Nasi in the sugar sure, industry. Sure. It is happening with the teachers. And even where there is private sector and there are violations and transgressions, mm -hmm. they are not strident in addressing them. So I believe that there is something that is specifically absent from the government armory in a, to, to address to see the, the problems of workers, see the, and appreciate the work of labor. Mr. Nicholson, let me bring you in at this stage. Now, if there's a platform 
that President Granger has consistently advocated. <laughs> it is education. It is education. Yet here we are, and he has taken a lead role on this matter. Is something strange, ironic about that? I don't think it's anything strange or ironic. I think he's just turned a blind eye on the very political platform he would have proposed or would have talked about. I remember in May of 2015, Labor Day came to the Union Hall where the teachers were there uh, when he was in opposition going towards election. And he indicated to us his that would one... Be a few, that would be a few days before a election. A few days before election. He indicated to us his 100-day plans. And most of it was for the education sector, the teachers, the learners. Today we are faced with a president who has turned a blind eye on the, ta the high level task force report of which, mind you, he would have implemented when he would have stopped us from going on industrial action last year. He has, never, he has not said anything to us to date about the high level task force. Only the Minister of Education, she came and she brought different documents indicating that they cannot do this at this time, they cannot do this at this time. But the president of this country has not said anything to us. Now, before we get into all this conversation, what is this strike about? I think it's important that the public, the viewers on this program understand. And, and uh, Madam General Secretary, perhaps right. you're ideally placed to say, let what me, is the strike let about? Let me say to you that this strike is based on the non-refusal of the government non-refusal non-refusal of the government to accept the report of the task force uh -huh. which would have outlined there the recommendations coming out of the proposal that gtu submitted since 2015. for clarification who appointed the task force and who the task it? force like my colleague said was um the brainchild of the president, president his excellency president david ranger this came about after the Guyana Teachers Union issued to the Ministry of Education a threat of strike action last year. The press, as a matter of fact, the Honorable Minister Joseph Harmon, Minister of State, he intervened first. He called us and he said, look, the utterances of the minister then is not a reflection of the government of Guyana. They have by no means directed the minister to say the things she said to us at that time. And so he said to us... And the minister he was referring to is... Honorable Minister Nicolet Henry. So after we spoke with the Minister of State, the president was out of the country at that time. I think it was two days after the president returned and the president indicated that he wanted to speak to the GTU's executive. We met with the president on Monday. At that meeting... Monday. We, I, I can't just can't remember the date. I think it was sometime in, in October, Janu November. January. Because we had a January vigil. of 2018? Yes. Oh, sometime, yes. sometime around Yes, okay. There. Whatever. Anyhow, the thing is, the president met us at his office. We had Minister Henry and Minister Don Hastings at that meeting. He outlined to us that he's quite disappointed with what transpired, but he wants to reassure us that education is priority for his government and that teachers are important people. And for us to move on, he wants, he's now going to ask, um, he has already instructed the minister that a special task force is going to be put together to look at the proposal in its entirety and to also look at the report coming from the Commission of Inquiry into the education system. That was our mandate. At the follow-up meeting with the Minister of Education, the government's representatives were introduced to us. We had the, the Finance Secretary at that, um, as one of the representatives. We had Mr. Mark Wilfred, who was the political advisor to the President. We had the PS, Ministry of Communities, P.S. Ministry of Education, Ms. Gail Williams, who is the Chief Personnel Officer at the Guyana Public Service uh, Ministry, and we had the Human Resources Manager 
from the Ministry of Education with um, along with the Chief Education Officer, Ministry of Education. Yes. Those are the persons who were the representatives on the government side. What was the terms of reference? What were the terms of reference of that task force? Well, the task force after we met, um, a chairperson was identified. Uh, we had a chairperson who was identified in the form of Genevieve White Ned, who sat at one meeting and we never saw her again. Subsequently, the PS Education took on the leadership because we were going there to these meetings and GTU noted that we don't have a chairperson and we don't want to go ahead without having a chairperson. And at that point, we suggested that the Ministry of Education's PS, Vibert Welch, at that time, that he assumes the position of chairman um, for the task force. At that task force, GTU and the government were asked to put forward uh, terms of reference. We had, both parties had their individual documents. We sat there, we went through them, and we came up with one document which was supposed to be used as the guide. When was that, that, that single document? That single document was done, I think, sometime in February or late January. Some, some, so there were, sometime there were good there. movements. So there were good movements with the task force. The task force worked feverishly up to the 22nd, I think it was, of December last year. Mm -hmm. Because we were trying to complete most of what we had to do. However, we recognized that there were some open endings and we decided to have some extra time. And so in March of 2018, our final document was presented to the Minister of Education with the hope that the minister will take this document because since we perceive that the minister is interested in the business of education, we thought the minister would use the first opportunity she would have gotten to present that document to cabinet. But it was not presented there until maybe a month or two months after. Mr. Nicholson, could you tell us what, what were some of the recommendations made by your task force? Well, some of the recommendations that were made by the task force, given our salary proposal, was an increase in salary for teachers for 2016, 2017, and 2018. So we started with 40% uh, for 2016 and a 5% for every preceding year after. Um, another recommendation was... So it's 40, 5, 5. five right. So 4, 5. 4, 5. Because it's a multi-year, 5 what? years agreement. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. Another recommendation is for an increase in coding allowance from $8,000 to $16,000. Mm -hmm. Another recommendation that was there is for us to have an increase in scholarship for teachers attending the University of Guyana from 30 scholarships to 50. Those are recommendations that came out of the joint task force. Of which the government, the government centrally rep, The government reps Correct. agreed to all of this. Another recommendation was that of uh, the lower of class sizes because we recognize that there are too many students in one class for one teacher to control. So what we indicated at the nursery level, we would have had uh, 20 to 1. The grades 1 to 3 in the primary school, you would have had 25 to 1. The grades 3 That's to 6, students, the class, the teacher, teacher yes. right? The grade and only a single teacher. Only a single teacher. And uh, the secondary, it would have been 30 to 1. And the practical instruction center, which is more hands-on approach to all that they're doing, 1 to 15. All those and many other recommendations were basically shut down by the government. So the government shut down recommendations by a task force that which it representatives were apart was represented of. that's mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. lincoln in your view would these proposals would these recommendations by the task force this is because i'm assuming this is less than what the teachers would have wanted did you compromise to in terms of getting the task force to agree to these numbers Yes. Um, we did. Let me say to you that when we did the proposal that GTU submitted, the task force, the members of the task force representing the government, they came and they said to us, look, the government cannot afford this because it is not sustainable. We had our talks and then we eventually arrived at a position here, a position there, a position there, a position there. I think what really happened is that when the task, when those per persons who were chosen from the government, let me say to you, they were strategically chosen. 
the persons who sat there because we have issues um house lots and housing and so the ps communities he was identified there yeah scholarship gail williams from ps from the public yes. service ministry when it came to things like duty-free concessions and and um the additional quality monies allowances for additional qualifications uh scholarship and and all those others mr mcwilfred and the ministry of education uh theme they were dealing with that when it came to the issue of the finance. increase in salaries we had the finance secretary there yes and so we thought that with these people here and the mandate they were given by cabinet we came we would have been able to have this document that was presented approved by cabinet it did not happen lincoln here comes were were the recommendations by the task force realistic in your view yes i i i believe that they are realistic and the the, the only the problem here is an understanding of the process. You see this document, this task force was appointed by the president. So you're saying it's not about the numbers but about the process? It is about both. I'm okay. saying yes. It is it is from the standpoint of the union that made the argument a union's position is justifiable. And when you take into consideration um, the the numbers, the scales that the teachers are on, mm -hmm. if, if the, 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 there's an impression given that a teacher starts about only a forty thousand dollars per month, that's not true, which is far from what it is. You know, the, the, what has not what has not been done over the years. Right. This is their salaries. Right? Over the years, is a, a true assessment and evaluation of what ought to take place in the education sector. Well, let me come back to the process with you. The, when you write the president of, this country, of any country who has executive responsibility, it is the law, or you engage the president of the country, he has executive responsibility. When you're finished here, there's no recourse for you to go anywhere else. Or if you want, you can go to the courts. This committee task force was appointed by the president. I wrote about it. When that committee presented his report, it becomes the president call. Mm -hmm. And no longer the the mm -hmm. I'm saying that there is something that is definitely wrong mm -hmm. within the government. I do not want to believe that they, they're anti-worker, mm -hmm. anti-people. But well, you have big concern with this resistance yeah. to having a Ministry of Labor. Yeah, yeah. That's been one of your pet peeves. Yes, and I'm going to tell you what. The government ministers, even the minister within the Ministry of Social, Social Protection, Protection, or even the Minister of Social Protection, they see the question of industrialization or the, 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 the worker management relationship as one we only get a strike, or we, have, uh, I mean, we solve it, or we, have, we seek to apply the strike. There is obvious industrialization. They don't see beyond that. Um, I do not believe that this is the first time you have had a cabinet in this country without somebody who is deep in labor, in labor, industrialization, or labor. Good to say. It is the first time, and that's a serious gap. Look at the, you look at the opposition. The opposition has within its midst Gillian Borton. Former TUC president. Former TUC president who understands it. Mm -hmm. Gillian is a 
I work with or I know of a capacity. You are Kumar Chan. Right? In the government, there's nobody to advise on it. There's nobody who practices this is thing. The, is the Department of Labor functioning as, a, as an advisory arm to the government? In the when government? you have, their industrial relations are two levels. Mm -hmm. You have a level where you find technicians mm -hmm. will do something. It has to be that what the technician may be doing here. It has to be guided by a political direction mm. or a philosophy, you know, um, because there, there, there is that, that absence of deepness. They will continue to err because, uh, let, let, let me point out, it's in, when you hear the Minister of Education talking, we will win the war, right? Mm -hmm. um, war. It is, you know, the language that is being used. Is, is the minister taking her cue from the president who saw this or sees this <laughs> as a confrontation? <laughs> what do you think, Mr. Nicholson? Well, well, I don't. You've know. had to relate. You, you've had to relate to to, to the minister. I, I, I assume. I don't think the minister knows exactly what she's doing because I would have sat at various meetings and, and she would have echoed various sentiments that I don't believe as a minister of government, someone leading the education sector should have made those utterances. And when you look at her daily going out to all these meetings, outreaches that she's having, she's basically doing things at wins and fancies of the government. She's basically doing things that she doesn't even know or understands what she's doing. Look at what she wants to do. She wants to take training teachers from CPC and bring them into the school system. That's illegal. You can't do that. They were not appointed by the Teaching Service Commission. They do not have um, the documentation to be in those schools so, to perform the task of a teacher. And I recognize from the news that the parents at, at, at Queen's College, they were up in arms mad about that because they're, they're looking at a senior secondary school in Guyana, one of the primary secondary schools, and you're bringing training people. First, I'm not saying that they're not competent, but they would not have completed their full training at the civil part of college education, and they don't have the experience. You're bringing retired teachers, no problem with the retired teachers, but are you, do you remember, or do you have the knowledge that the Guyana Teachers Union and the Ministry of Education would have had an agreement that the, the clause states that the teachers union must agree and must sign on to the documents of those retired teachers coming back into the system. I don't think she would have, t have a clear thought of what she wants to do. <coughs> However, she is the minister, and by virtue of power, she keeps using that over and over again. Well, I'll tell you something, it, 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 I'll tell you something Chris. I, 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 I get the impression as I speak with operatives, that is a government position. I believe it's a government position. The government has decided. Because all the trend, you know, I, I had cause to say to someone that what, let us backtrack a bit. In the sugar industry, what the government did as it relates to severance, they broke the law, paying those people the law. Government don't go there and arbitrarily just break laws, right? <laughs> you break the laws. You believe that what you did, you have trampled, um, like somebody was talking to some, some comrades I knew, and they support this government. And you know what, what they get, I'm getting from it? Is that, look here, it's Gao, it's Nasi, in sugar. So what? We trample them. It is the same attitude is you know, being brought to the teachers. You know? We, we have been able to silence Gao and Nasi when it comes to sugar. We do as we like. We break the law. We send on workers. We have pay severance. So we come here now. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they talk about here, that is we spoke about here, is that we are making, rather than seeking, to have a resolution on the matter. We are seeking now to bring what we call in industrial relation, scab labor. Lincoln. We want to bring scab labor. You and I 
go back a long time about scab labor. Yeah. And you mentioned sugar. Yeah. Now that that does that's that's antithetical to industrial relations, is it? Yes, it mm -hmm. is. It puts so it will now put the union and its members and perhaps even the public yep. against a set of other people from members of the public mm -hmm. who are you, you call them scab laborers um, or, or strike breakers. Strike so, yeah, but the scab. The scab we call them. In industrial nation they determine a scab. <laughs> what I, again Lincoln and I go back a long, long time and we we know that part of Gaisuko's problems have been explained by the fact that we had persons going into the cane fields without any experience or expertise and doing more harm than good. Do you see this strategy by the minister Claiming that, look, we don't want an interruption in children's um, education. Do you see this very action that, according to her, is intended to be pro the children, actually operating against the interests of the children and their education? Of course it is. Oh. Let me tell you what. Those trainees that are coming there, which curriculum they're going to be using to teach the children? Because the teachers who are the real teachers for those classes, most of them, they have their curriculum or their, what we call their schemes, they have them at home. So what are these trainees going to use to teach the children? All that they are going to be doing to the children, well, not at Queen's College and Bishops and Roses and so on, but, but the primary schools and the nursery schools, all they're going to do is confuse the children and create more confusion for the real teachers when they would have returned to school. But in addition to that, when you are a trainee teacher and you're coming out from college and you go into the public school system, you have to be guided by a teacher who's already there for a number of years. Your mentor. Mm -hmm. And so you have to go through an induction program mm -hmm. before you actually have a class of your own, a one-year induction one year program. Induction. And that program was instituted by the Ministry of Education. So are you going to tell me that you are going to forget about the induction Well, they're breaking their own rules. Yes. And have the trainee teachers in the classroom just like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We yes. are heading down a road for a disaster, and we're going to create more confusion for the learners when we start that. Let me tell you what, Mr. Ram. I, I think this position, whether it's a government position or not, the road that the Minister of Education is going down is the road that she alone way, you know. Most of her, her officers, they're not supporting her in terms of the actions that she wants to take. The minister is there, and uh, from the reports that we've been getting, interacting with her officers, that she listens to no one. And I'm saying, I, I don't understand how, you know, we could have a minister of education who doesn't understand her role. We have a chief education officer. We have several other um, deputy, we have deputy chief. We have assistant um, chief education officers. We have regional education officers who were trained to perform these duties. But the ministers seem to want to be ministers, CEO, DCO, and everybody in one, does, does which is the, bad. Does the ministry have an industrial relations officer or personnel officer or somebody? I know they have an attorney. They don't have a I know they have an attorney manager, who which is a does, different, no that's different. I know they have an attorney who looks into legal matters, matters and I think that's the same person they've been putting there to write a few letters which if they want to, to play the big bad bully game and decide that they want to continue with this strike. Like we said earlier, if the ministry feels that they can go up, they want to push this, this whole business of having training teachers and so on and, and to decide that they don't want teachers then gtu is up for the long haul you know because the thing is we have said to the officials at the ministry of education in the form of the ps Ms. mr welch the gtu would have submitted a proposal for 40 percent this position is not written in stones this is up for negotiations the 40 percent the 40 percent yes. up to a day like today Nobody from the Ministry of Education or the government 
would have come to GTU with a position to say, we cannot afford 40, but we are offering 5 or 10 or 6. What the minister did two weeks ago, or maybe a week and something ago, was to come to the GTU with a ballpoint figure of 700 million to say to us, this is what we can offer. You either take it or leave it. Well, that's hardly the approach to get um, normalcy returning. Put it in terms of persons, a junior teacher, currently and under your proposal, uh, and, and various levels, uh, just not, not every single position, but how does it, how in, in real life, a junior teacher, what does a junior teacher get now, and what is it you're asking? All right, a junior teacher, as you would, would have seen from that document there, an acting teacher, where we don't have the acting teachers in on the coast, but we have them in the hinterland. The salary that they are receiving is this figure here. That's 57000 That's the that. figure there. That's what they're living on. And you, you're talking here about people, teachers who have got, who, who have families. These when acting we, teachers, what qualifications are they? Um, most of them, they have, um, some of them, the CP some of them the SSP that we used to have a while ago, and some of them may have two or three subjects, not with the exception of math and English. Are they trained? They're not trained They're teachers. Not trained. But if you go down the line, you're going to see where we have the trained train teachers. Where yes. we have the trained teachers. So where we have the trained the train teachers, a trained teacher will carry home something. Mm, 100,000. Um, Let's carry home or gross? Gross. Gross, gross. that's before Taxes and Before NIS taxation, and yes. 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 And they're they're gonna take home something like about um this salary here, seven to seven thousand something. That's a trained teacher. That's a trained yes. teacher. After salary. how many years of training? After three years now yeah. at CPC, mm -hmm. three, three years, years of training. CPC, Cyril Potter Cyril College. Potter College of Education. Yes. Are those figures re so now let's go back to those figures. Because that's probably Let the me say to you, Mr. Ram, the document I have in front of you here is the increases that we would have gotten in 2017. Yes. And so this, these were the, the figures here, the salary ranges that you're looking at, and this was the percentage that was given. So the people who used to be receiving this salary, you have now gone... And, and this is no. a bunch of Th people. Yes, that's a range. This mm -hmm. is a range. This the is a whole big is, bunch of people. So people are, people are having here from 55 going way up the line. And that's why we, the union argued for the debunching issue to come on board. Because this will separate all of these people here who are bunched up. And that's, that's an issue that has plagued the, the public sector. For decades, this business of debunching. Yep. Um, a lot of people, as you talk, people don't understand how important this debunching exercise is. Yeah. Because what may well happen? Yeah. What is what has happened in the public sector is a situation where somebody who may have been trained in specifically in the teaching services, who have been trained for three years, coming in 2018. Or was it 2015? And that person who comes in at a, a minimum, all that person gets is an across, or when they give an across the board increase, that person may move from, say, $10 to $12. Mm -hmm. The person who comes in 2018 will get that $18. Start right there. And because, and what has happened there is that there is no incentive for you to perform mm -hmm. and there's no incentive for you to continue in this in the system because there are two things here one is that years of service is not only being determined at the end of time when you serve but as you go along in the system, you must be credited mm -hmm. for, something. for something. And then the other thing is the performance. Um, performance increases. Because you, those things are absent. You're, like today, somebody tell me, I was talking to somebody and say, you know, 
I, uh, the question they want to ask is whether this, the teachers perform. I say you can only measure the performance if you have set two sets of things, a major job objective and what a minor job objective, mm -hmm. income, um, and see how you achieve them at the end of the period. You don't have that in the system. And the Lutchman Commission, Commission spoke about these things. Mm -hmm. What has happened is that we allow those things to, to go, these ideas to be just brushed aside. We have to revolutionize the entire public service. But we have to fix this problem first. We yes, have to fix this problem fixed. first. Now, we talk about the trained teachers and, and, and where, what, they, what they get. How many years training they go through? Three years. Three years. What kind of salaries they get the during training? During, no, during training, except for those teachers who are doing the, the, the in-service training, um, they would receive their salaries yes because they go to classes in service they training. go to classes yes. in the evenings yes but the teachers who are there full time at cpc they get a stipend of what i think it's fifteen thousand dollars no fifteen thousand dollars for how many years three years three years so that's the kind you would expect some kind of payback a realistic pay afterwards afterwards so you go through three years getting about 25 percent or 20 yeah about 25 percent of the minimum salary and then you I get want, i want to tell you something this. Mm -hmm. what Kali said just to really shock me i am really really <laughs> shocked which one they um the they stipend. Like? Stipend? Yes, stipend. i am really really shocked all the normal things like that throw you off a chair i can't understand that now, th there's, there's a perception that is fed out there. Teachers are greedy, they all give all these lessons, they make this extra money, they don't pay taxes, they, they tell children, look, don't bother with school, we're going to do it, we're going to do it Saturday morning, are you coming? How, is that a fair criticism of the entire teaching profession? It's not, and I want to say to the public out there, Teachers are human beings. Teachers have mortgages just like any other person out there. Teachers have children. Teachers have got to eat. Teachers have all, they have all the utility bills to pay. And so if your salary cannot suffice it, then you will have to seek out other ways and means of getting another form of income to supplement which and, is and, to balance, people, and to balance which you, is exactly which what is exactly people. what other people do. But you know, it's quite disgusting. And very disturbing when you have when you go there and you look at what teachers do. Teachers they sell, they make things, all kinds of little things to sell. Some of them work at nights at Qualifon. Some of them are into security jobs at nights to maintain their families, especially the male teachers. Is this what we really when when we talk about education and being serious and having education as our priority? Is this what we're really talking about? You know, let me tell you, Mr. Ram. Just about two months ago, I was in the in Bermuda. Um, and we every time I go to the Caribbean Union of Teachers Executive meeting where I serve as the third vice president, I would use the opportunity to go visit at least three schools. Well, don't let, don't let me tell you about the schools. But all I could have said at that point is, I'm not sure when we will get to this level. And then another thought came. When our Minister of Education is traveling to all of these meetings, don't, don't they see these I wonder if she don't take time off to go and visit some of these schools and walk with some of our technical persons so they can take some pictures so that when they return home, they can use this as a starting point to design the buildings that we have. You see the buildings that we got here? These, these um, daytime prisons that we got here? You know, GTU, we have not started talking about these buildings that we have here that are not conducive to learning. The, the we, have the place conditions. we have endured the worst of some of the conditions, but our teachers, because they are dedicated, they work under these conditions. There are some schools when you go into those, when you are at those schools, if it rains, 
the teachers, they will have to pull their class sure. in a corner and they set buckets to collect water. But we haven't been complaining about that. There are stairways where the, 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 the treaders are missing and teachers go and they skip and they go up because they are committed to the task. But yet this Minister of Education is talking about teachers are being unreasonable and the union is being unreasonable. The minister don't serve in those classrooms, you know. We went to Madi about a month ago. Madi Nursery School, grade one children, the year one children, 60 grade one uh, year one children to one teacher. 60 year one babies to one teacher. And at that point, it should be much, much less. As you go up, it's higher. It's it is, supposed, it is yes. supposed to be 20. 15 to 20, 60 to one teacher. And they're now, these are children who are now starting nursery school. And the Minister of Education isn't saying anything about that, you know. But she's talking about how reasonable teachers are, and teachers are greedy, and the GTU is unreasonable. What impact does this have on the quality of teaching? The, the, the working conditions, the salaries, the, the, the necessity, as you mentioned, call for security guards at night. What impact does this have? If the teachers are not comfortable, let's start with the workplace. The teachers need to be comfortable. The learners need to be comfortable. They need to be in a conducive environment. And if you don't have that presenting itself from the first instance, you would not have production at the end of the day. If teachers are not comfortable with the salary they receive, as Ms. McDonald rightly said, they're going to do other things and they're going to be distracted or from- Or quit the profession. Yes, because if you look at the profession no, right now- not quitting the profession. They're gone to the Bahamas, they're gone to Bermuda. You notice we just had some ads coming from other places. Where yes, where? I think Antigua. Had one, no, we had um, some, some Grenada, for, some um, in Europe, Europe and all those places. places. They have advertised teachers. For teachers. And most times you find a Guyanese teachers jump on the bandwagon and they go because Guyana, when you look at the Caribbean countries and you look at CUT units, Guyana is the lowest paid unit. Guyana and Haiti, the lowest paid units. The, the, the countries where teachers are paid the lowest. So, with all those different factors in, I wouldn't want to stay here if I, have the, if I have the opportunity. When you look at this profession, we have a handful of males. Why? Because the salary is so small, it cannot afford the male to have a family. And most males are families. So you, what you do, you go look for something that's more lucrative and that will give you much more finance to su support you and your family. How do you address this perception that you, the teachers and the union, are not making, have not made sufficient effort to resolve this impasse that has developed. That you're walking into a strike almost, you, you want it to happen. Mr. Ram, let me say to you, like I said earlier, the GTU submitted its proposal in 2015 of November. You did, you did yes. We have been the one who, who were agitating all along. We would have written the Chief Labor Officer, Mr. Charles Ogle, several letters indicating to him we need his assistance so that we can have the, the ministry talking with us with regards to our proposal. He tried on about three or four occasions to have the PS who was then um, Ms. Ned. We had some, some, some discussions. We, we looked at some of the issues that we agreed on. We signed off on them because the union was saying, look, as we go through, let's sign off on some of these, on some of these conditions yes. and start implementing them. Let's go through, sign off and start implementing because we recognize, especially with the, the ones that talks about duty-free concession and additional qualifications for um, allowances for additional qualifications. We, ex we recognize and we knew for a fact that with the duty-free especially, if we don't do that part in a hurry, then many of our teachers would lose out yeah. because the duty-free concession has a clause that deals with age. Yes. You, in that document, it said that the head teacher had to be, you had to be there for a head teacher as, an, as a head teacher for three years and you must have five years remaining in the job to be qualified. Yes. That's eight years you're talking about. Now, while we were dancing around all the place, while our colleagues at the ministry were dancing around all the time, our teachers have been suffering. And so we said to them, let's put 
let's do it in parts and start implementing. That was too hard for you them to do. You keep saying them and they. Who are the they? The Ministry of Education, our, counter, our partners, the minute, you see, we call them our partners all the time because we are serious about this business of education and improving the education system. And so with everything that we attempt to do, we have always included the so ministry. who are you Let negotiating say, with? Who are you, if you, if you negotiate, if you go to the ministry, who are you negotiating with? They, we're supposed to be negotiating with the PS, the Human Resources Manager, the DPS Finance, and maybe one or two other um, support staff so coming from the Ministry of Education. We're not supposed to be negotiating with any minister. You, you say, good, I'm coming there. You, you say that you get sympathy at, at the, the level of the officers in the ministry. Mm -hmm. So why aren't you getting that kind of understanding? Why can't you get agreement well, at that level? Well, if they're sympathetic to your cause. The thing is, the ministry officials, the PS and others, they could not pronounce on 40%. They could not give any figure. And so we, this, everything just went flat. No communication, nothing, until the GTU picks up the phone, call, or writes a letter to say what is happening, no talks. Eventually, coming out of that, when we recognized that we couldn't get anywhere, we said to the minister, we will have to seek redress in some other form. And that form would be industrial action because what you're coming to us here with, it's not acceptable. Let then me, is when the president intervened. Let me ask you, Lincoln, in a situation like this, what does good industrial relations practice require? You have, you're running headlong into these lights, uh, probably an oncoming train. Yeah. A catastro catastrophe in the making. What would constitute good industrial practice. What would you say to Mr. Ms. McDonald and Mr. Nicholson that they should go back to their union and say, look, we need to get this done? Um, let me say to you that as I listen to them, what they have done is to, I, we cannot fault the, the approach that they have made. We've exhausted the process. Over the period. The, 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 their approach to the, to, 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 to the issue has been guided by um, Taiwanese principles, um, and the TUC is not is it's an experienced, long-standing organization. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How many? When was it established? The TUC was established in like 1953. Yeah. So it's been around yeah. 65 years. So, yeah. So what we're we doing? In fact, the the, the 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 union's approach cannot be faulted, right? And in my own experience as a trade union negotiating at the table. What we do is that we sign off, we initial as we go off, we go on. And if there's necessity for implementation, we seek to implement. Why you implement is to, is to reduce um, dissatisfaction mm -hmm. in, the, mm -hmm. in the group that you are negotiating on, on behalf. And remove the that, tension. Remove that the whole edge. restlessness in it. You know, you, you do those type of things, right? But in this case... Can I ask you to pause here? Mm -hmm. Have you done that? We have done almost uh, like you're gonna come everything back yeah. that we were supposed to do. Let me tell, let me say that to you. The teachers, the executive of the GTU, we were quite heartened when the president stepped in and decided to institute that task force. Our hopes were built high because we said with the task force, this will be the final of the final of the proposal. Having completed that document, we waited for months to be told what will happen. So that now you are saying to us after the president would have intervened at that point and would have taken that out of the Minister of Education's hand, we have now returned right back to the Minister. We have returned straight to the Minister of Education. Who created the problems in the first place? The, the, the issue here, you know, Chris, is not... This strike, as I wrote a couple days ago, this strike is not being called by the union. The employer called the strike. Yeah. Because what do you mean? This, they, uh, they created all the, the conditions. conditions. All the conditions. The strike, all the conditions. Right? So they are calling the strike. It is not no longer a situation 
where the union is doing this thing. Is that the, the, the union that is, is, is driven to move on the strike, strike, the strike down path. Children's education involved. Yep. Monday, schools actually begin on Monday. Mm -hmm. What were you doing this week? You say you, say you were on strike. What, what's, what's, uh, what's this it? week is the preparation week for the commencement of school on the third. So what you would have the teachers going in to do this week is to prepare their classrooms. Oh, so they're actually going in, they, they're actually required to go in. They're actually school. required to do that during this week. So what we did as a union and coming out from its membership and, and mind you, people are saying that it's the executive decision. It's not an executive decision. It's a membership decision for us not to attend the preparation week this week. And if there is no approach, very good approach from the Ministry of Education for us to continue for the first week of school. Continue what? Continue the strike action. And then? And we go and we go as long as we get a response, a positive response from them. Lincoln, is there, is there an established procedure? Again, I, I, I come to your expertise, experience and expertise. So when a situation like this is reached, the two parties get some kind of resumption agreement in which they agree to certain minimum let, conditions. Let, let me tell you what. The moment that this situation, my understanding, the moment and my experience, the moment a situation like this where arms are locked, and heads are going to get into contact. Under normal circumstances in the past, the, the Labor Department or the Minister would have called in the parties. Let's mm -hmm. see what can be done. Because in the public, it's, you don't wait for it to happen. You call in, say, come in, we observe this. Because in every agreement you have where you call, avoidance and settlement of dispute. Yes. So the, the ministry has a, has a responsibility to, uh, to do things to avoid it from happening. In this case, it's the Labor Department and the, the what you call the, the, the legally appointed minister who is um, Minister Amnali. They have a responsibility to call. That was not done. It was not done. Nobody paid attention to it. My understanding, and I wrote about this too, when the ultimatum was given that they were going to call the strike, um, they were now, the, the union was invited by the, by the Ministry, Ministry of Education. Education. In the delegation of the government, articulating the government's position, mm -hmm was all the operatives in the Labor Department yep. <laughs> and the ministers, right? What they have done is to compromise the entire process. The, those people yeah, should not The arbitration have mediation there. process. Yes, okay. and I wrote about it, and yesterday in the Starbuck News, all John, yes. all John, an experienced man, who worked both that in... That man is Kaiser. a giant of industrial he relations. That man should have been called in. Yes, that man well, worked both, both in, in, in Gaisoko, in the work in, in, the, in CARICOM. That man wrote and the man I liked him. And it's of that reason, a matter like this, since yet they have been compromised, the next place you gotta go is arbitration. We have a few minutes left. Um, I wanna ask you, Mr. Nicholson, Ms. Ms. McDonald, what can be done now? Or are we too late? children to be in their classroom being taught by legitimate, proper, knowledgeable teachers. Are we past that point? We have not passed that point, and that is what the GTU, we have been saying to this government all along. We have not passed that point. The thing is, we have decided we will not go to any conciliation because the mere fact that the, at the meetings that we were invited by the Ministry of Education, we would have had the two ministers of 
um, social, social protection, protection and the minister with responsibility for labor, we would have had the chief labor officer and the consultant to the, 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 to the minister with responsibility for labor, all of them sitting there representing the employer, the government, and the GTU sitting on the other side. And it wasn't only their presence, but they were saying to the GTU, look, this is all that we can, this is all that we have, so y'all take it. And you know what was Who's most... Who is saying that? Including the labor people? Including the labor people. And you know what was most disheartening? What was most disheartening is the fact that we submitted a proposal for five years, but the government is now saying to us that 2016, 2017, it's already passed and gone, so forget it. We are dealing with 2018, and this is only going to be a one-year agreement. Next year, we'll deal with some. We'll deal with 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 with, an, with we'll deal with another process. So, but as it is now, we have remember indicated. Remember my question. Yes, what can we do? Yes. Coming, um, we received a letter from the Ministry of the Department of Labor inviting us to a meeting today. The GTU turned up at that meeting today, and we said to them today, "This is the position of the GTU." We will. We are not interested in conciliation. We want us to go straight to arbitration, and we want to go to arbitration because of the fact that you have compromised your positions. And we laid out our terms there. We said for us to go there, both entities will identify one person to represent their interest, and we will have uh, one. We both entities will agree on one person to be the chairperson. Have you got a response to that? Uh, the ministry today, uh, they came unprepared, but they were, um, they were boosted up, you know, with some, 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 some spunks from the ministry of the Department of Labor. And so after we were sent out of the meeting and the Ministry of Labor officials were talking with the ministry officials, when we returned to the, the boardroom, we were told that the ministry will now, they're now seeking conciliation and they want us to exhaust that process before oh, we get to arbitration. arbitration. But we held out, this is our position, and we said to them, we will give you some time to speak to your principal because you can't make the decision here. And you call us at any time and we are willing to talk with All you. Right, we have one minute more. I'm going to allow you that time to make whatever appeal you think is appropriate to the parents and the public out there. I would want, or for us, parents should understand that this is a bread and butter issue. This has nothing to do with your political affiliation or whoever you would want to represent at any point in time. What we are fighting for is only just. If you, un if you don't have the proper information, like today I was in a, a restaurant and a, a guy saw the slogan on the jersey and he was like, what are you already fighting for? And I had the opportunity to explain to him so that he understands what is the issue. And when he listened to me, his words were, well, they don't tell me that in the media. So it means that the information being peddled out there is not accurate as to what we are fighting for. We want the students to know that we still love them. They will always be in our heart because well, as a teacher, when you see a child move from point A to point B, that's the only thing you ever want in this life. And when you go into the banks and you were being called, Miss, come or sir, come. Oh, Miss, you taught me, sir, you taught. That's a sad, that's an inner satisfaction that we always look forward for. Miss McDonald? I would just want to say to the general public out there that the GTU is a professional organization. We have our children's interest at heart. We are serious about the business of education. And we want you to support us in this venture. We're not doing this because we want to spite your children. We're doing this because we want our teachers to be comfortable. You see, Mr. Ram, our teachers don't have the kind of luxury that our ministers are having. And our teachers live on meager salaries from day to day. We also want to say to our counterparts, the Ministry of Education, and to the president of this country, Mr. President, if you're serious about the business of education, I think you need to act and act now. Lincoln, I'll give you 15 seconds. Um, this issue, as I see, as I, I as the, the public need to understand that this issue is not only about the teachers. It is about the society that we are going to be developing in the future. Um, if you, if you, if you pay peanuts, you will only get more peace. Understand that the conditions under which education ought to take place is not conducive right now 
and the teachers together with the communities, the people in the community, the parents and friends and what have you, need to hold hands to make the environment better than it is now. Mr. Lincoln Lewis, Mr. Collis Nicholson, Regional Vice President for the Emperor of the TUC, Ms. GTU. Oh, GTU, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Greta MacDonald, General Secretary mm -hmm. of the Ghana Teachers Union. Thank you so much for coming on Plain Talk, for explaining your position. Uh, I, I, I really do hope, and I appeal to the government, the Minister of Labor, and the President to avoid a confrontation. Mm -hmm. Let us get back to the table. Let us get our children into the classroom. They are the future of our country. Mm -hmm. We're talking about preparing them and preparing the country for the readiness. Please, let us listen. Operators, viewers, thank you. Good night. Thank you, thank you for having me. Never seen you rock so oh. Now it's time to play.